So, uh, hey, hi, my name is Jana. I'm the host of the evening. How are you? Good. I hear your microphone, your mic. You have sound for me? Oh, perfect, uh -huh. perfect. Hi. So, you're the Amiga guy, right? That is correct. Nice. When did you buy your first Amiga? Uh, that was winter 1993. 1993? Yeah. Oh, me and nice. my brother uh, got one together. And how many Amigas did you own since then? <sighs> I actually own more Ataris than Amigas. Oh, really? How many Amigas did you break? Mm -hmm. Two, three, maybe. Oh, oh but to be, to be honest, and you, you're the you're yeah. the software guy. Are you able yeah. to soldier the Amiga if anything breaks, or you have a friend like? Uh, ah. I'll turn to a professional. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what are you going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about how to write high performance code for oh, yeah, the Amiga Power Hundred. Uh, okay, so yeah. that was the so name of the of the <laughs> show. Any guys programming for Amiga here? Hands up. Okay, two, three. Uh, any guys who never programmed a line? Music guys, any graphics? Okay, so they're mostly programmers. Is there going to be something for non-programmers? None whatsoever. Here's your warning. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, so... So, so like, yes. Okay, so the the you stage know? is yours, come on. Thank go. you. <laughs> Yes, so um, if you don't read a slamling language, then this is the perfect time to go out and have a beer or two. Let's roll on. We'll start looking at the 68000 processor in isolation. We're going to take it from our Amiga motherboard and plug it into a minimal motherboard, which is just the processor and the memory, and that's it. Once you start programming for the 68000, after you all wonder, why is my code slow? Why is it fast? Where is the difference? So when I started doing uh, performance-related coding when I was young, I spent an awful lot of time looking through these uh, clock cycle tables in the 68000 processor. Problem with those is there are lots and lots of these figures to memorize. What I didn't realize then, but I figured out like 20 years later, is that all these numbers, they're not just made up. There's a system behind them, because whether or not something is slow or quick in the processor has uh, everything to do with how the processor is built. And, uh, and uh, fortunately, the people who design the processors, they build them systematically. So uh, if you look through these, then you can find uh, some patterns in there. And uh, by knowing these patterns, you don't need to know the tables by heart. You can already then guess pretty well how much time will a specific instruction take, how much time will a set of instructions take? So in order to understand that, we need to take a quick look at the 68000 architecture. The large blue box here, that represents the processor itself. So uh, it has a piece of own control logic, which uh, sometimes it goes and uh, stuffs values into the processor register, sometimes it fetches it from there. It's going to fetch instructions from the infrastructure fetch part, and it also goes uh, to the memory interface, where it wants to read or write something. Now, um, two things are interesting here. One of them is that that little block down there, the 16-bit ALU, that's where all the computations are done. So uh, even though the processor seems to be a 32-bit processor, it can only do 16-bit calculations in one go. Another thing that's interesting is that uh, both the reading instructions and reading and writing data is going through the same memory interface which means that that memory phase becomes a bottleneck. 
So um, we see that long word operations, they will be slower than word operations. But now we have the main problem, the memory access. The CPU can only access one word or one aligned, uh, one byte or one aligned word at a time. And one mem memory access takes four cycles because the processor is built that way. And because of all this, you'll see that uh, most operations, except if you're doing something like a multiply, where the processor will stop and crunch numbers for a while, then the performance will be constrained by the memory accesses needed to complete the operation. So uh, here's a bunch of rules of thumb that I developed. If you can just count how many memory accesses does the processor need to do in order to complete running a piece of code, multiply that by four, then you get a good starting point. Where the longer word operations, add in two cycles for each of those, and also add uh, counts for CPU intensive operations. If you do this, you don't need the tables, and the error margin is going to be like 10%. Now, uh, when I was pre preparing this presentation, uh, I used a 68,000 simulator called the EZ68K. I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of it. It has an editor. Um, here you can edit your assembly code. You can tell it to compile your code. OK, it compiled. Let's run it. Now, this is the simulator. It won't show any graphics. I think it also has a, like a terminal window. But what's cool about this is that it immediately gives you source level stepping through your code. You can see all the registers like in a debugger. And here's the kicker. Notice the cycles value. That's cycle accurate information on how long it takes to execute in a pure 68,000 system, not necessarily an Amiga 500. That's the second half of the presentation. So um, I've tried then to uh, optimize a dot queue. And uh, this is what we're going to be looking at for the next 20 minutes. Over and over again, same piece of code with minus tweaks. <laughs> So here are the steps that we need to do when we get dot cube spin. Take a vertex, rotate it, project it, scale it a little bit, and plot a pixel. This is what the first version looks like. The exact instructions are not so important. What's more important is the structure of the code. Think not in terms of here is computing this thing, here is computing that thing. What's more important is when am I doing reads, when am I doing writes, when am I doing add operations. So if we take a quick look at it, then uh, this here is this part here is rotating a, a vector by a rotating matrix. So you can see a whole bunch of fetching values from uh, inputs and then multiplies, which are the dot product portion of it, including the adds to, uh, to complete the scalar product. Then uh, apparently we, like, we scale up um, to pixel coordinates. Here's perspective correction. OK, we need a couple of divides. A tiny bit of fussing around with the values. And then a put pixel. And we're done. Now, um, how many cycles does this take? <laughs> Pardon? Uh, no, it doesn't. So uh, 
in this case, if I were to just guess by looking at this, I'd guess wrong by a factor of four, something like that. Fortunately, we can do better. It so happens that the EC68K will, when it assembles something, then it will produce a, a listing. And here we find something that's very interesting, interesting to us. Notice in the left-hand columns, the values 30, 28, with the zeros and so on, these are the actual code bytes. So now we can see how large is this instruction. And now we can tie this to my claim that um, the processor is constrained by its memory accessing. So we can see that this instruction here, ap apparently the processor will need to fetch two words to know what, the, what to do. And then it's going to fetch a third word, a data word, in order to complete the operation. So that's three words, six words, nine words, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, if you do the math, then you end up with this. So it's 64 words of instructions, and a bunch of data accesses. You can see it multiplies half the time of it. But using the approximation, we end up with like nearly 1,200 cycles. So uh, what are we going to do about it? Where do we start? Can we reduce the number of instruction words in a simple way? Let's hop back and look at this program. I'm noticing one thing. This repeats and again. And apparently this is two reads just to get the instruction and an extra to get the value. So three reads. If we catch that in a register, then we'd only take the three word cost once. Down here, if this was just fetch something that is cached in a register, we're gonna save two memory accesses. So, if we do that, then, uh, and also try to get rid of the more of these offsets, then we end up with version two. Um, ones over here. Now, changes that we can see is that there's a, a quick fetch of all the values, and then you have these blocks instead of memory accesses in a lot of places. Another difference that you can see is they used to be, the multipliers we used to have direct offsets in there for each memory read. We changed it to automatically walking with the pointer because then the instruction gets smaller. Net result, we got rid of 25% of the code and a couple of data accesses. Sweet, 10% quicker. So what about those multiplies? The problem there isn't memory access, it's that it's heavy CPU work. So this is when we bring out our trusty maths book. It so happens that uh, you can rewrite a simple multiplication as uh, two additions and then two squares. The nice thing with the square is you can compute that through a table lookup. So effectively saying we can train one mul multiply against addition, subtraction, table lookup, table lookup, which is more or less what's over on that side of the screen. So each mouse is going to turn into this. We get version 3. And we can see how it's fetching a couple of values. This is what used to be one multiplication, two multiplications, three multiplications. It's getting pretty long now. 
So if you actually look at the performance, then we see that it's, it's actually faster according to the prediction. But in practice, it's two cycles slower. So we gain 450 cycles from getting rid of the uh, multiplies. So how could this turn into five, like at least 450 cycles extra of data shuffling? That's weird. So the, what went wrong was essentially that that table lookup, it needed to do uh, long word operations. And uh, these, uh, these memory accesses are becoming prohibitively expensive. If we just look at this one line, how much is that? How much memory accesses? Let's look at the disassembly. There we go. There we have the same line. Then we see that it's gonna be two words just to fetch the instruction plus two words extra in order to uh, fetch the value. Plus these are long word operations so they're extra slow because of that. So um, what we're gonna do then is we'd like to get these figures down. Can we get rid of long word computations? Then we'll automatically get less data accesses. So let's, ha let's then have a look at the input data. And if we look at that and shift things down in the squares table, then uh, we can make this work still and uh, have pretty much the same logic just doing word operations. So in this case, it's the same block Five lines of code, two memory accesses, which keeps repeating over and over, but it's word operations now all the way. And uh, that step only, we lost uh, a third of the data accesses and all the long word computations. Ah, so now we gain 10%. That's nice. But we did end up with a whole lot of instruction words, okay? How could we reduce those? Well, where did they come from? Probably this, well, this block that keeps repeating. So there's a lot of maths in there. And then there is this indirect addressing thing. Is there something we can do about it? Well, uh, it turns out that we're doing this uh, lookup a lot of times, but for, uh, for every uh, vertex that we're processing, this pointer will be the same every time, and for the first multiply, this value will be the same every time. It only changes for every frame. Whereas this one changes per vertex. So um, what we can do is perhaps compute several different base pointers. And if we do that, and we start writing that out. Then we end up with something like this. Much tighter. Except there's one problem. Notice this column downwards. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, we're out of address registers. Crap. So what's happened now then? What went wrong? We're in our registers. So we can try shuffling around. Or maybe we need to split up the code. So we could just go in there and chunk it up in some random way. But since we have a chance to A, make things a bit more complicated, and B, 
also apply a bit of theory. Let's do that. Now, um, what we're going to do is, for every vertex, we take a vertex, multiply it by a 3 by 3 rotation matrix. This results in a new 3D ver vertex. We're going to project that to a 2D coordinate, and that's effectively going to result in a pixels, pixel set in the frame buffer. We could split it into two transformations. So imagine that the first could be one set of code, and the other part is then piece of code number two. If we want to, however, we can separate it even further. We could compute just the x component, and separately compute the y and the z component, and the final transform takes all these three together. So if we do that, and we use the, uh, use the approaches that have been popularized by the data-oriented design movement, then uh, we, could, we should reason about this in terms of streams. We have a stream containing all the x, y, z chords. We want to transform that and spit out the stream with only x chords. Separately, we we'll spit out another stream with the y chords, and similarly the z chords. Then, once all that's done, we're going to run a separate batch processing run where we're taking these three independent streams, mix the result together, do projection, and draw the pixels. If we try that, then we end up with this version. So here we have one, two, three subroutine calls to do those dot products. And the final project and draw as a separate routine. By the way, notice that we can reuse the same routine for each of these uh, output coordinates. So down here you have it. This process is just one single element. Now, what we gain from this is that we've managed to slice down the problem so much that we're no longer running out of registers. There's a bit of extra overhead since we're running the same thing effectively three times. You need to fetch the input data three times. But the nice thing is that this gives us um, a strategy for how to break things down, other than saying the top pop of the loop and the bottom half of the loop, I'm going to split into two separate loops and do something in between. This gives us a, like the data-oriented approach, uh, gives us more chances to look at the problem from different angles and possibly find better split-ups. And uh, yes, one other thing that's interesting then is that when we project and draw, we'll be fetching the x, y, z coordinates from three different places in memory. But that's all right, since it's not slower to fetch from three different places, and we managed to get down the set of logic in this one to a small enough chunk that we're no longer running out of registers here either. So we finally do the math on this, then it turns out turns out that we have a few more data accesses, but we get significantly less instruction words anyway. So we gained another 5% from doing this rewrite, which I think is pretty cool. And we can continue like this is. I mean, we have divisions in there, there's still an extra multiplication, and we can unroll loops, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, but what I find, uh, I don't think uh, that that is going to show us anything new, really. It will be like rehashes of these same, these same concepts. The core of uh, you know, what I want to demonstrate here was really how counting the instruction words 
and then augmenting that with a couple of other like a couple of other heuristics that together gives you a quick way to summarize roughly the performance of the piece of code. So um, if we now take a look at the Amiga 500 system. The big difference here in the 500 then is it's no longer just 68,000. Up here uh, you have uh, chip memory and the custom chips. And you have all these different devices in the system which want to be able to access the like, custom chip registers and the read and write memory. So the way that it's been set up is that the processor has absolutely lowest priority. And uh, each of these may at any time want to do a memory access. So if two of these devices want to access at the same time, then one device will have to wait. Which means the big difference uh, in the Amiga 500 compared to the pure 68K example is sometimes the 68K processor will be blocked by other devices. Now, when uh, they designed the Mega 500, they designed it so that the clock of the bus runs at uh, one bus cycle equals, equals two CPU cycles. And there's a very good reason for that. It so happens that this 68K processor, it can't really use the, mem like the bus 100% effectively. Here's an example if the 68K processor runs through a series of knobs. This is going to be four cycles, four more CPU cycles, and four more, and so on. Now, uh, if we look externally at what's happening on the bus, then we see that for the first half of the knob, then the CPU is do, doing various preparatory things. And it's only really during the last two cycles when it's showing bus activity, which might interfere with something else. And if we're doing a multiply, then it's going to be something like this. The multiply instruction is two words of size. Therefore, it's going to be fetch those instruction words. But then the CPU is going to spend a large number of cycles doing internal computations and not even touching the bus then. So this means that there are good opportunities to let other system hardware be running in parallel with the 68K without significantly uh, interfering with it. One more thing that is good to keep in mind is that uh, all DMA in the system uh, is it's coordinated based on a coordinate system that maps pretty much to the display. It's similar for pretty much all 8 and 16-bit uh, machines. But we have 227 cycles in a line and 312 scan lines. Now, there's not a lot of uh, system DMA going on in the first couple of lines. It's really where the display DMA kicks in that you'll see like, a lot of system DMA activity. If you want to, then there's a register in the machine which you can read, and it's going to tell you exactly which coordinate in this coordinate system is the machine at right now. So this here demonstrates what the start of every line looks like. The interesting thing here is that we have uh, reserve, free, reserve, free, reserve, free, etc. The designers uh, of the uh, Amiga hardware, they set it up so that the critical DMI is only every other bus cycle. Which means that if there's a NOP instruction here, it's going to be idle 
while uh, the system they made it does its thing, and then the NOPI instruction is going to go out and do its memory accesses. And continue like that, so it's going to line up perfectly, and the 68K won't even notice that the system DMI is, uh, is present. And later on then, there is, uh, when we come to the display DMA portion, then this is a repeating pattern that's going to repeat every eight bus cycles when it needs to fetch uh, graphics. So no bit planes on, no DMA activity whatsoever for bit planes. And as we turn on bit plane after bit plane, then more and more of the DMA slots are used. Up to four bit planes, every other will still be free. So the CPU won't be like feeling any interference. Five or six, then it gets pretty bad. So as soon as we hit five bit planes, then we'll on average lose 25% CPU performance there and so on. Now we have uh, another chip in the machine called the copper, which whose, dis uh, whose description wasn't. Mm, it took me a while to understand, okay, what does the thing actually do? But once I had grasped that, then uh, it was pretty straightforward. It's going to read two words from memory, and then it's going to do something. Maybe it's writing to custom chip register, or going to a wait mode that it has, or do a skip thing. But what's interesting about this, when you talk about performance, is that it's always ever going to do this one, two bus accesses, and then it's done, and then it can do its thing. The blitter, however, is a bit more complicated. So you can tell it to fetch from zero, one, two, three different places in memory, do a logic operation, and write out the results somewhere else, always with word-sized operations. So let's say that we want to get good performance out of the blitter. Then uh, it's going to need three bus cycles before it gets started. And then it needs, depending on how many of these channels you have active, it's going to spend two, three, or four bus cycles doing its thing in order to process one word. Also, there's a little bit of pipeline in it. so. Uh, if it's going to spit out 1,000 words, then it needs to do 1,001 iterations. All these things together mean that if we're doing something more interesting than just clearing the screen, then the blitter will try to run at full speed, and it only has like three, four, five idle bus cycles in there. So. Uh, Maximizing blitter performance isn't really about making the blit itself go fast. It's about making sure that you don't have downtime between the blits. So we have three things that we need to fix if we want to get that performance up. We have to make sure that as soon as the blit is done, we need to be able to react to that as quickly as possible. We should make sure that we don't write more blitter registers than we need to. And also, the way that we write them should be in as quick a way as possible. So let's say that we hook up an interrupt handler. And we're thinking, when the blitter's done, it was blitter finished interrupt, and our interrupt handler will then wake up and write blitter registers, which then starts a new blit. First, the interrupt handler itself, like the processor's interrupt handler, that one will start instantly when the blit is done. However, 
in order to make our program start, then uh, the processor needs to do some housekeeping. Store where it was, store the status register, fetch where our handler is located. That's all right, five words of memory access. Then we need to detect the difference. Is this V blank? Is this vertical blank? Is this copper? Needs a couple of uh, instruction words and some data access. And finally, we're going to shuffle a bunch of predefined words of blitter data from a queue somewhere into uh, the blitter registers. So this is going to be at least 90 bus cycles in a typical example. And to correlate that figure 90 to, uh, to this. 227 in line. It's going to be about this long, maybe. About a third of a scan line between uh, the blitter going idle and blitter starting again. We have another option, and it's to have a copper list which uh, drives the blitter. So we, we have a wait operation in there which is going to wait for the blitter. And then we do 10 or so C moves, whatever number we need. The nice thing about the, uh, nice thing about the copper is it has zero latency. It doesn't have that startup time. So if it's waiting, then it's instantly going to wake up. And it doesn't need to feature about and store away temp registers, etc., etc. So it will instantly start feeding this move operations, which writes to the blitter registers. That way, we can get that down to from 90 to about 40 bus cycles of latency. However, we can do better than that under some circumstances. If we think about what the copper is doing, then uh, it's going to wait for the blitter to get done. And then for every value that it needs to write to the blitter, it's going to run one instruction. So it's going to do two memory accesses per word of configuration. Imagine that you were busy waiting with the CPU. And you had all the configuration ready in CPU registers. In that case, if you were able to detect very quickly that, oh, the blitter just got done, a single move em to just write out a whole bunch of long words to the blitter registers could, in theory, get it down to just that memory transfer plus like two words of overhead for the move em itself. And then we should, in theory, be able to get down to like 20 bus cycles of latency which then takes us 90 to 40 to 20 bus cycles. Problem with the bits of waiting there is, the blitter is going to eat up all cycles when it's running, more or less. So will you really be able to prepare the next blit in time? And that's why, personally, I'm a fan of using the copper to decouple the CPU from the blitter. And then, on a general level, then if you want to maximize throughput on uh, the Amiga 500, then what you're looking to do is, apart from making sure that like, your code is written in an intelligent way, then you're also, on a system level, uh, trying to ensure that there are as few idle DMA cycles as possible. Because every idle DMA cycle is a chance to accomplish something which you didn't take. So uh, you can shift around your, uh, your code and chunks of code to try to reduce the amount of idleness that is happening. And uh, this is also another place where it's useful to use the copper to drive the blitter because it gives you more freedom uh, in placing the CPU logic at, in different order within the frame since uh, the blitter won't start doing its thing based on the CP CPU logic until the start of the next frame. 
Another thing that you can do um, is to uh, use copper interrupts around here and around here and uh, use that as a simple task switcher so that uh, any kind of CPU activity that m benefits from running quickly is done outside of the uh, active uh, display window. Now, uh, the best tool the re which exists for viewing this and understanding what your situation is like, uh, that's a DMA debugger in WinUA. So it's going to give you pixels in different colors depending on what's going on. You see the blue lines? That's uh, display DMA fetches. Uh, this section here, I believe that's blitter activity. Probably blitter fills. Whereas the green bits here, I think, is uh, blitter line drawing. Not 100% certain there. Uh, the yellow ones here, those are copper instructions. So with this, then you can see, like you can you can get a bird's eye view of how are your different types of uh, system activity organized. Are they placed in a good order? Do you have uh, do you have gaps? Do you have bubbles occurring? And is there a better way for you to structure these things? And that's all for today. Thank you, everyone. Do we have any questions? Oh, that's one. Okay. Uh, when you were preparing your slides, um, I noticed that you weren't using um, the operating system that I'm allergic to. Uh, during this presentation, you've shown several Windows things. For those of us that are allergic to that, are there any alternatives? In other words, Easy 68K, is there a way of running it or something similar outside of running it in Wine? And is FSUAE able to do the same type of thing as WinUAE? Very good question. I don't know. I don't use Linux at all. <laughs> okay, thank you everybody. That was great. Thanks a lot for this 45 minutes, which I understood nothing of, but it was wonderful to meet Assembler again. I saw it in like 1996. Actually, I don't know if Zdan remembers, but he was my first Assembler teacher. I was like 16 year old, untalented kid, and my mom paid money to Zdan to teach me Assembler, which lasted for